Welcome to the Monroe Review, where it's all about connecting, sharing, and valuing the arts in the central San Joaquin Valley. I'm Donald Monroe. Today is March 28th, and we're going to be talking about the busy art scene in April. On today's show, we get to check in with two singers from the Fresno Master Chorale, which is performing Bach's beautiful St. John Passion in April. We also have a special on-location story about Fresno artist Stan Bitters, whose ceramic works are receiving international acclaim. And for something completely different, we talk to the folks behind FresCon, which is coming up really soon in April. But first, let's recap some of what I've been covering on MonroeReview.com. One of my best read stories in March was a piece about two exceptional artists and friends. Daniel Keyes and Adam Longati are featured in an exhibition at a Sense of Place gallery through the first part of April. Keyes is specially known for his still lives and depictions of flowers, though he's also a terrific portrait artist. And Longati is known for his exquisite landscapes of the central San Joaquin Valley. Both have deep roots in this place. Now, you might think that a successful two-person gallery show is all about putting two artists together whose subject matter or technique is the same. Or perhaps it's about playing off the differences between them, with the curator making the contrasts in the two bodies of work big and bold. But in the case of Keys and Longati, it's about the chemistry between them as artists and friends. I could sense that chemistry the moment I sat down with Longati and Keys for a conversation. Another popular story is my interview with Brian Ray, who's currently starring in Hairspray for Good Company Players. It's the story of a hardworking actor who's been doing community theater for 25 years, working his way up from small roles to big ones. In Hairspray, he plays Wilbur, the gag shop owner and the father of Tracy Turnblad. I asked Ray to describe himself in three words, and he told me, bookworm, introverted, and odd. He's also quite funny. It was, it was really fun to write a piece about the kind of actor who doesn't always get a lot of attention. Hairspray continues through May 19th at Roger Rocca's Dinner Theater. There were lots of other events to cover in March. One of the biggest, of course, was Wicked, which played a two-week run at the Saroyan. I thought it was an excellent production, just like the other two times it's played in Fresno, and I enjoyed the connection between the latest Glinda and Elphaba. You can read my review at MonroeReview.com. I also reviewed the Fresno State production of Book of Days, the Selma Art Center production of A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder, Fresno State Opera's Theater's Madam Butterfly, Fresno City College's The Little Prince, and Good Company's A Shot in the Dark, which is still playing, by the way, and which I highly recommend. And for something just plain silly, I conducted my very first ever drunk interview. Now, I wasn't drunk, though that would have been interesting, but my subject was. It was all planned because Casey Ballard was part of a rogue festival show called Swill that involved a random actor in a group playing Romeo and Juliet getting drunk before each performance. The show is long gone, but the interview is still a pretty fun read. Maybe someday we'll do a drunk Monroe review on CMAC. Now, let's welcome our first guests. Alan Peters and Allison Windmiller are here from the Fresno Master Chorale to talk about a very special upcoming concert. Welcome, Alan and Pleasure Allison. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, it's great to be here. So, so you are going to be singing uh, this monumental work that is so big and so hard <laughs> that the last time the chorus did it was... 1957, 1957, March of 1957. Well, first of all, that says something about the longevity of the master chorale, the community chorus, um, but it also says something about the, the difficulty of it. Is that what would you It say? is a difficult work. The harmonics are different than some of Bach's other things, and uh, you'll discover a lot of interesting choruses. One of the most exciting parts of it, and difficult too, is that the choir represents the mob. So much of the story of the passion involves a mob shouting and screaming and ranting and raving, and the choir does that in the course of the passion. Well, let's let's start off just with um, introductions, I guess. So, Allison, you are the stage director for this uh, piece, and that's not a usual thing. It's not. Uh, generally, the passion is not staged. 
Uh, there are, have been a few productions, both professional and non-professional productions, but it's a rare occasion. So this is a special treat for our audience. So you actually have people who are in costume playing some, some of these major characters, and then you have um, choir members who are then singing, and they'll be, they'll be wearing the the regular concert dress, is that the case? The the singing choir members, uh, the singing and performing choir members will also be in costume. We have about a group of 15 who will be doing the acting parts. Um, and so uh, the soloists or those with the small singing parts represent characters that we know from the story. And uh, the other uh, singers represent people, the crowd, soldiers, various smaller parts in the story. So Alan, you are the president of, of the Master Chorale. Yes. Right now. And you've been singing with them for a long time. Well, the first thing I did was also Bach. It was the Mass in B minor in 1966. So I've been in it about 53 years. Interestingly enough, one of the singers in this St. John Passion performance also sang it when it was sung in 1957, John Donaldson. John Donaldson, who is um, a legend. For, <laughs> he has just been such a faithful member of that group. The choir is 63 years old, and he has been in it since the first performance. Wow. So tell us a little bit more about exactly what a passion is, because there might be some viewers who aren't familiar with that, that style. In Bach's time during the Baroque, and even before that, it was the practice of the Protestant church particularly to read the entire story out of one of the Gospels regarding the arrest, the trial, the uh, conviction and the uh, sacrifice, the crucifixion of Jesus and his burial. <coughs> they did this on Good Friday so that it became an annual event that on Good Friday they would sing some composer's version of that particular gospel. So in this case, we're singing Bach's understanding of the gospel of St. John, and it's a story so that it's almost like a religious opera in that we begin at the beginning and there's a storyteller that's called the evangelist who basically recites the scripture and these actors and soloists and the choir, they begin to fill the positions of all the people that were connected to the story of the passion. So it's a very dramatic It event. is dramatic, the music dramatic is dramatic. Mu music to experience. And what's more than just the story is that Bach decided to add to the story poetry and other reflections. There are four major soloists, soprano, alto, tenor, and bass, and they each have a role in singing a reflective kind of aria of two or three or four of them uh, throughout the course of the, so for example, right at the time that uh, Jesus is slapped, they'll suddenly have an aria come in and talk about what do you mean hitting Jesus uh, while he's sort of down and you've got him under your control? Mm -hmm. And these reflections then happen as the story is told. The, so, so Allison, tell us about like the size that we're talking about. How, how many musicians are going to be involved with this? With the, uh, in the whole piece, mm -hmm. we've got 100 and about 160 chorus members. We've got about 30 uh, orchestra and the continual group, uh, which is important part, um, supporting the recitatives, so piano or player and uh, cellist. So and we, then, have, we have lots of people yes. up, up there on stage, which kind of adds to the, the drama, right? Plus a children's choir. And a children's choir mm -hmm. from? Rayburn Intermediate Rayburn School Intermediate. in the Clovis uh, Public Schools. So the, the, the Fresno Master Chorale, which used to be called the Fresno Community Chorus, um, it's, it is a, a long-standing institution in, in our city. Um, tell us a little bit about it, Alan. How, how it's been does around it work? for over 60 years. It does work with the Fresno Philharmonic. Uh, whenever the Fresno Philharmonic needs to do a, a piece that has choir or chorus with it, uh, we're the group that, um, that uh, 
becomes their colleague in presenting that kind of a work. So for example, this last uh, spring we did, uh, it was on uh, Armistice Day, November the 11th, a hundred years after the World War I armistice, we sang Britain's War Requiem with the Philharmonic. And it was just a gorgeous, gorgeous performance, so just one of those once in a lifetime moments. And your conductor, uh, Dr. Anna Hammer is, is spectacular, spectacular and she is, has brought so much uh, to this group. Absolutely. She's such a pleasure to sing for. I've sung for many, many, many directors over my more than 60 years singing. You've had a lot of experience. Had a lot of them and she's one of the best. So tell us, when is uh, the performance of St. John Passion? Performance is on April the 28th at the Chagoyan Performing Arts Center at uh, Clovis North High School. It starts at 2.30, but you better get there at 1.30 because there will be a pre-concert talk that explains the passion and, and the production itself. And it's not that big of a hall, so you better think about getting your tickets er early. 750 that. seats is say, all yeah. that it seats. Well, so. it sounds like it's gonna be spectacular. Thank you so much for, for coming in. Thanks for Thank you. asking us and inviting and us I'm to really talk about it. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today, Alan and Allison. Now you might not know Stan Bitter's name, but you certainly know his work. He created the iconic fountains that are so beloved on Fulton Street downtown. And he's got artwork all over Fresno. During his long career, he's been a pioneer in the field of ceramics. Here's the great thing. In his 80s, he's really hitting his stride in terms of international recognition and success. CMAC producer Kyle Lowe and I were able to spend some time with Bitters and learn about his latest project. For an artist in his 80s, Stan Bitters doesn't show any signs of slowing down. His art is receiving international acclaim, he has more commissions than he can handle, and he's enjoying a new level of success in his career. Stan invited us to his Fresno studio and home. It's mostly uh, happy to have work. I, I remember the 50 years that I suffered uh, getting loans from my family to keep on going because I felt it was that important in my life and so it's now uh, obviously paying off in terms of having stuck with the pro program. The way he related to the material, to the clay and the kind of organic way he was looking at things really intrigued me and I thought this is a guy to watch. So you're a big fan of his work at the Fulton Mall. What else would people might know, know Stan's work in this area? Well, he has a lot of work in uh, buildings all around town. I, at one time, I was uh, researching public art, and all I had to do was go up and down streets downtown, out to the airport. I saw Stan's work everywhere. He has so much work, he, he, can't, he can't get to it all. Well, it's a good thing he's got good workers, because he's getting older, like all of us. And we have to designate some, some jobs to other people, because he's in now he's become so well known, I guess you'd have to say famous, that uh, he needs to have help to get all of this work out. So what's your favorite Stan Bitter's work of all time? Does anything come to mind? Well, I have a couple of pieces of his that I really love. That they're sculptural and they have heads on them, so they're like people with bodies, big chunky bodies. and. I also liked when he was making fountains, because I had a fountain before, which is also very much of like chunks of clay that are threaded onto pipe and then the water spills out all over the, the uh, clay boxes and it makes a wonderful sound. I like those things. I like those things that I have, I guess. <laughs> you, you make good choices. <laughs> I think I do. So what do you envision for this space? It's not, it's not gonna be open to the public, correct? But you want there to be a place for people to, to come and gather? It will be a gathering point. Uh, I do have uh, uh, many people that request a visit to the studio, and so 
This will be on the so-called tour that uh, eventually uh, I will give them uh, the invite to come in and talk about things and uh, attitudes because I think very strongly that the sculpture aspect is still in the planting and the relation to sculpture, uh, I think that's the statement. So I'll be pushing that as part of the tour. So something you told me last time um, I thought was, was interesting, you kind of joked that um, you don't really like people all that much. And it's funny that you're building this or you're making this place um, in which it's designed for people to... Yeah, that, that is kind of interesting when you bring that up. I thought about this and, uh, you know, I'm an anti-people person. And, <laughs> and here, uh, what I've done is to buy a house over that 800 foot uh, space I had in the uh, studio and really uh, present it in a way that uh, becomes a uh, people related uh, interest and in doing that I've crossed from being contained with myself to opening up and saying you know here I am uh, you know Here's what can happen with space. I'm uh, trying to integrate uh, sculpture and uh, clay attitudes in the space. And I'd like everyone to be a part of it. And uh, so doing that, I've peopleized the area. So we got windows, which I've never had before, working in a metal building. Uh, so this concept of outdoors, I've extended to tearing out walls, putting more glass in so I can relate from the outdoor to the indoors and open it up and have a fluid situation and that therefore the garden becomes so much more important to the interior actually. And so uh, the two uh, will become more viable as time goes on and I keep integrating uh, architectural items of the ceramic. It's a very inspiring story. I, I really um, admire your, your, I guess your work ethic in a way. Oh, yeah, I really uh, devoted my life uh, to do it. You know, there was not doing, during my youth, there was uh, not doing anything with dating or uh, involvement with people. It was just, well, as at work at Hand Sump Company, I used to take the sleeping bag and sleep all weekend uh, in the dry room and then be able to work uh, uh, during the day. And, you know, just regarding, you know, getting paid for it, it was just uh, something that there was a need to do it. I felt obligated to my interests and, and where I was going in life. And so, the attitude is pretty much stuck uh, most of the way uh, up to now, and uh, I think that's what it took to really do it. So isn't Stan just a fascinating guy? You can read more about my interview with him and get even more in-depth in his life and his, this newest project of his at MonroeReview.com. So are you just itching to put on your Captain Marvel costume? You can get that chance at the fifth annual FrezCon comic convention at Fresno State. Here is Ramiro Marino and Jessica Garza to talk about the event. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. For us. Thank you. So you two are have been working hard on <laughs> this event, and yeah. this is the the, the fifth, fifth year. The fifth year. Yeah. How many people do you expect to show up? Oh, we're hoping anywhere between five hundred and a thousand. Five hundred. We always and a welcome more from the community. Always, to join us. yeah. <laughs> so it's it's at Fresno State, but the the community is welcome. Oh yes. to come, and Definitely. it's free, right? It's free, free entry, free parking. So. so so set the scene for us, Romero. Tell us what what would a first time visitor to this uh, see when they came. 
Yeah, I think the first thing that they're going to see is definitely like the spirit and culture that Frescon has already because it's been going on for four years now. Um, there's definitely like a community that like definitely follows it. Um, but I think a first time part event attendee would see is just a, like the spirit and a lot of people dressed in cosplay. Um, I think it's definitely going to be one of the things that they that pops out and stands at them, um, especially since we do have a cosplay contest at Frescon. So now I was talking to you before the show, <laughs> and I know that you, Jessica, are a cosplayer. Yes. And you, Romero, you'd, you'd rather just like, what, what's the word for it? I like to participate and like watch. Watch um, the other costumes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And is that kind of typical? So you have people who are really into the costumes, and then you have people who just would rather skip the costume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And so, Jessica, what are you going to go as? Ooh, um, it's either between um, Roxanne from a Goofy movie, she's one of my favorites, or possibly Starfire from Teen Titans. OK. Just whatever costume is more comfortable to run around in for the day. <laughs> so when we're talking about the costumes that people mm -hmm. wear and the things that they're interested in, it's actually a pretty broad array of subjects, right? Really You're broad, not yeah. talking just about Marvel Comics mm -hmm. or Star Wars. Um, you're pretty much all pop culture, right? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So tell us, about, tell us about that. So cosplay is just dressing up as your favorite character and kind of just appreciating the artist and the content creator. And you can dress up as anybody as you want, um, anybody you want because cosplay is all inclusive. So anyone can join, it doesn't matter. And you can dress up like someone from Star Wars. You know, we see a lot of uh, Princess Leia's, which is always fun. You can even dress up from someone as Downton Abbey if you wanted to. That's what I. If, that's what <laughs> I will be. I, I'll have to decide which. I think it'll probably be the the Earl. Okay, you see, cool. yeah. you just show up in a in a tux and and, I'm there, and use right? a British <laughs> accent, and yeah, there exactly. you go. <laughs> so, Ramiro, what are you what are you passionate about in terms of? of your interests. Yeah, I'm definitely passionate about, and I love watching like Harry Potter, um, Star Wars, and uh, Marvel. Um, those are like the fandoms that I I typically am interested in. Okay. Um, so I'll, if I were to dress up that day, I'll probably be dressed up in like a Harry Potter costume as a student, so. And is it Harry Potter himself that you would, that's like your favorite, or is there another um, character? I have done the Pottermore quiz, so I am a Gryffindor. So yes, I'll probably be okay. wearing uh, Gryffindor colors. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the structure of the event. I know that there's some, some special things that are going to be happening. Yeah, so all throughout the day, we're going to be having panels from Fresno State professors. I promise they're not all super academic. <laughs> um, we can let you know that one of them is called um, MCU versus DECU, how not to make a bad cinematic universe. So talking about the Marvel versus DC argument. So that one is one of our panels. Um, we are also going to having a community fair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the community fair is open to any organization in the community um, that show that showcases and highlights what the services and things that um, opportunities that um, community members can take advantage of. And to round off our show, we'll, we will be having a cosplay contest, both for kids and adults. So you come out, show off your costume, all of the hard work that you've put into it. And then at the end of the day, we're going to be having a geek fashion show. A geek fashion <laughs> show. So, t so tell us about that. Yeah, so the Geek Fashion Show is an organization that puts on the show um, all throughout the state really and um, they are all inclusive so it doesn't matter gender height size anyone is welcome even dogs are welcome to participate in the show and the geek fashion show is exactly what it sounds like modeling um, clothing and articles um, purses hats anything based off of geek culture so this community has really embrace the term geek then. <laughs> I, I, I'm, that's what I'm getting the yeah. vibe here, right? Yeah, right. I would think so. I think um, geek and nerd, um, pop culture enthusiasts have really become something uh, to be proud of and really wear like your, your geek pride. <laughs> so I know one of the big movies out there is Captain Marvel. Oh, so, good. so are you anticipating a lot of, you know, Brie Larson type we, um, fans? We hope to see some Captain Marvel cosplayers out okay. there um, just representing um, Marvel's first uh, female superhero on the big screen as in her own title movie. So we're hoping to see that. And 
just curious, what did you think of the movie? So good. Okay. <laughs> You're a big fan, I'm right? I'm a very big fan. I thought it um, resonated a lot of issues that young women deal with, not just young women, but young people in general deal with. And um, I really love the issue of, uh, you know, not having to prove yourself. But I won't say anything else. Everyone needs to go see it. <laughs> okay, okay. So I've always wondered, how much does it cost to put together one of these really cool <laughs> costumes? To put together a costume? Oh, gosh. Like, do you, is it something you buy online ready-made? You or can. Do you, and, and, like, what would those go for? Is that... So ready-made costumes, kind of just depending on the quality, um, can range anywhere from, like, $20, like your standard Halloween mm -hmm. costume, up to, like, 200. Um, I know cosplayers that have um, created costumes for like thousands of dollars. You can really go all you out. You can really go all out. Um, I follow one cosplayer and she does Harley Quinn from the Suicide Squad. Her costume costs her about 1500 Wow. Yeah, well, just that's to something make it to be accurate. proud of. Oh yeah, definitely. It's very, it's very much worth parading yeah, down exactly but we also want to like let everyone know that you don't need to spend that much on your costume you can make your costume the night before staple it a uh, hot glue gun it <laughs> uh, whatever makes you happy you know we appreciate that you've come and you've dressed up and we're gonna love your costume so Romero tell us when is Frescon Frescon is Saturday April 6 and it's gonna be from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. at Fresno State at the University Student uh, Union balcony and parking is free parking is free admission is free um, it's an uh, mostly outdoor events, um, like Jessica said, we'll have all of those um, um, vendor alley, vendor alley community, um, community fair. fair, the panels as well. We'll also have a kids zone that is free for for children to participate in. So we'll have a themed fandom table, so like Disney, Marvel, DC, things like that that students can for. Scavenger hunt. Scavenger <laughs> We'll have inflatable. There, there are a whole <laughs> bunch of new, new worlds to explore. Yeah. 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 Come well, thank out. you so much for coming by. Thank you. This sounds like a really fun event. It's, it's going to be, be great. super fun. <laughs> yeah. So now it's time for the list, a selection of things to do during the month of April. The Fresno Philharmonic presents a world premiere of a commissioned work, which is a very big deal. The composition is by Danuk Wajernotne, and the concert is April 7th. Broadway in Fresno brings the hit Something Rotten to the Sororian Theater stage on April 16th and 17th. I saw this show in New York, and it's a very funny take on the life of Shakespeare. One of Hungary's most gifted musicians, pianist Dennis Varjan, comes to Fresno State on April 10th as part of the Keyboard Concert Series. And at the Second Space Theater, Good Company Players opens Neil Simon's Brighton Beach Memoirs on April 26th. Well, that wraps it up for this month's episode of the Monroe Review. Be sure to keep up online at MonroeReview.com for previews, reviews, giveaways, profiles, and more. A big thank you to our volunteer crew, yay! And a thank you to all our guests, Alan Peters and Allison Windmiller, and Ramiro Marino, and Jessica Garza. Plus a special thank you to Stan Bitters for letting us poke into his life. And for all of you, please keep exploring and supporting the local art scene. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.